My topic is breaking the roles of genetics by breaking DNA. And of course, before I talk about breaking the rules, I have to tell you a little bit about the rules of genetics. And believe it or not, everything started in Karlsruhe. Uh, Karlsruhe was found 300 years ago by the Duke of Baden. And the Duke of Baden built a chateau. And around the chateau, he built the city of Karlsruhe. And close to the chateau, he built the botanical garden. And he hired as head of the botanical garden a guy. Do you see this? Ah, okay. This is Josef Gottlieb Kölreuter. He was a professor of natural sciences, and he really started with genetic experiments. No genetic experiments were made before him. And there was this general thinking that genetic information is transferred from one generation to the next only by the male. So from, from, from father to son, and the mother is more or less an empty vessel. So females are empty vessels. And so uh, Josef Kühlreuter uh, made a decisive experiment, which is shown in the next slide. He took two different tobacco species that both look differently, and he crossed them. And what you see here in the slide, the result was that indeed the progeny in the next generation didn't look like the father. It didn't look like the mother, it looked differently. So if he was the first to show that both sexes really contribute uh, to the germline. And his work was the basis of the work of Gregor Mendel. And I'm sure you all know or heard of Gregor Mendel before. He just had his 200th birthday this year. And Gregor Mendel now defined this uh, transfer of genetic information in a much better way because he defined traits. And I'll show you a few of these traits in the next slide. So like the color of the flower or the color of the fruit or the height of the plant, and he then asks himself, are all these traits inherited together from one generation to the next, or are they inherited independently uh, from each other? And he found, at this, uh, and this was his model, that all traits are inherited independently from one generation to the next. But we know by now that this is not totally true. Of course, we know much more now than he knew the basis of what he called traits are genes, and genes are written in DNA. Genetic information is written in DNA, and this DNA is not floating around freely, each gene in our cells, but uh, these genes are organized in chromosomes. And I show you such a chromosome. In principle, this is a chromosome, and uh, you can think that each of these bricks is an individual gene. And let's say you have here this red brick. This red brick, let's say, is a gene for bitter taste of a fruit, and this green gene is causing a resistance to a fungus. And of course, a breeder wants to get these two, two apart. So a good gene, a bad gene, you want to get them apart. But if they are on the same chromosome, this is just not possible. They are always inherited together. So genes are linked on chromosomes. They don't segregate. So this is another important rule you, know, you should know. And now I come to another important rule. With the next slide, you see Charles Darwin. And the, 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 the take-home message here is that genetic information is not completely stable. There is always a little bit of change. There are always mutations if you replicate your genetic information to one generation to the next. So there might be that some of these mistakes are negative, but once in a while there is a new trait arising, a, a positive trait arising that is helping the organism to survive. So there is a selection advantage for the organism, and this is how we also explain evolution, and that we can really see this development of, high, of, of, of organisms that are higher and better organized over time. And in principle, what is important now for us in this specific talk is just the point that genetic information is not totally stable. So you might ask yourself, how stable the hell is genetic information? There is a certain amount of mutation occurring in every generation, also in humans. So from one generation to the next generation, you have about 100 changes, 100 mutations. And this not only applies, of course, to us as humans, but also to all other uh, organisms. And if you think about plants like barley in a field, 
which probably has a similar genome size, I have to say, as um, humans, you will find 100 mutations between individual plants in the field. But this mutation rate, this low mutation rate, was enough that breeders were really able to produce crop plants. Because what you see here is, uh, in principle, uh, um, uh, a wild mustard plant, and out of this wild mustard plant, over a long time period, breeders were able, by finding certain mutations, crossing plants, to really develop all these different uh, vegetables, like cabbage, like broccoli, or like kale, which is shown here. But this took, of course, a, medial, medial, uh, a very long time period. And so, in principle, since about 80 to 100 years, breeders were thinking, how can we do this better? How can we get m different crop plants or new, uh, um, um, new traits in crop plants much faster? And what was done then? There was, in principle, the idea to enhance the mutation frequency. So how the hell can we enhance mutation frequencies? And the way it was done in the middle of the last century was just to damage DNA, and this was done by radioactive uh, irradiation, and this radioactive irradiation induces, as shown here in this slide, double-strand breaks in the DNA, and these breaks are then repaired, and this repair process leads to mutations. And with these uh, mutations, in principle, new traits can arise. So in principle, you might ask yourself, how can this be? I mean, you destroy genetic information. How can you get something good out of this? But you have to see that uh, certain traits that are good in, in nature are not good for the farmer. I want to give you an example. So in principle, if you think about grasses, th these grasses have to grow very fast. They have uh, thin, long stems. If, on the other side, you have cereals with thin, long strands and a storm comes, the farmer is very unhappy because the whole field will be destroyed. So what the farmer needs are short stems, six stems in cereals. And in principle, all you have to do is to really kill the genetic information for the long stems, knock out the specific gene, and then you have short stems. And this is how this technology, in principle, worked. And I'm sure most of you don't know that we heavily rely on this technology, and you already depend on it in your daily life. I just want to give you two examples. Mutagenized short stem cereals are used for pasta, so durum wheat is produced this way. They are used for beer. So if you had a beer yesterday evening, or you will have a beer today after this uh, very nice um, presentations here, you will heavily rely on this technology. What is the drawback of this technology? This technology has the drawback that by radioactivity you don't induce only one mutation, you induce thousand mutations in the plant at the same time, and these mutations are completely undirected. So you have to really screen hundreds and thousands of plants before you find a plant with short stems. So it takes still a lot of time to come to new traits in agriculture. But of course, nature does it better. How is nature able to induce mutations in specific regions in a genome? Nature is using molecular scissors, and with this molecular scissors, DNA can be cut, and then also changes occur. So what we are working on since 30 years is we take the scissors out of the respective organism, and I have to tell you that all organisms have these molecular scissors, also you have molecular scissors in your body, and in principle, we, are, we tried to improve the scissors to really make a kind of directed mutagenesis. But the big breakthrough in this direction came just 10 years ago. And this is really, believe me, the biggest revolution in biology saw, I think, for the last 50 years. And this is the discovery of a specific class of molecular scissors. This is the CRISPR-Cas system, maybe you heard about this. This is a very efficient molecular scissors from bacteria. Emmanuel Chapetier and Jennifer Doudner, which you see in this picture, got uh, in 2020 the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And in principle, what is really the, the advantage is that with this molecular scissor, we can really be extremely precise. So on one side, the scissor is cutting like hell, but on the other side, 
we are also now able to direct in the genome one specific change and no other changes. So we can really go to the gene that is responsible for the long stems and knock it out directly. And therefore, this technology is so much better than everything we had before. If you compare the mutation rates, which I told you before, we are now really able to, in, in, in a completely new way, introduce new traits into crop plants. But what we also can do is we now can solve the problem of breaking genetic linkages. And I show you this. So in principle, remember, I showed you this chromosome. And the problem could not be solved. But if we take a molecular scissor, what can we do? We can cut now between the two genes. We cut another chromosome and bring then in a new combination this gene on another chromosome. And now the red gene and the green gene are on different chromosomes and they can segregate it away. This is something we developed here at the KIT just two years ago and I'm a little bit proud of this, that we are now really able to solve one of the big problems of breeding by really breaking genetic linkages. So, can we also expect from this technology really advance in our effort to get a more sustainable world. And I tell you, yes, I think so. And we are in the middle of this process. So one of the main problems we have in agriculture is that we want to get rid of pesticides. And what I show you in the next slide is a wheat plant that is uh, infected by a fungus, powdery mildew. This disease causes tremendous losses of yields. And of course, the farmers are fighting this disease with uh, pesticides. And uh, what we can now do with CRISPR-Cas, with this molecular scissor, uh, the plant in principle has a, has, a, has, a, has a factor, and at this factor, this uh, fungus can bind and dock on, and if we knock out the specific factor, the gene of the factor, we can really get resistant wheat. So in principle, what has been achieved by colleagues in China is that there is now res powdery resistant powdery mildew resistant wheat uh, that can be grown worldwide. And uh, with the same technology, it was also able to make powdery mildew resistant tomato or powdery mildew resistant uh, strawberry and ma more and more crop plants are developed. So this really indicates that we are using this new technology are really able to massively reduce pesticide use in uh, agriculture. And what is even more important and we uh, discuss this in all different kinds of meetings all the time. This is global warming. Our current crop plants are not adopted for global warming. So what we need if we want to use the same crop plants we use now, we would need more water, we would more, need more fertilizer, and we would need more land. Otherwise, yields will go down over the years massively. So the question is if our current plant species are not really heat and salt resistance, what the hell we can do to solve this problem uh, with the help of breeding? We have plants that are salt resistant and also heat resistant, but these plants are grown in Africa. For example, wild teff. This plant is in principle also a cereal, but of course it doesn't produce this big fruit, so it's not really a crop plant. So what we can do using this new technology is we are really able, by changing a few changes into the genome at the same time, we can try to make a crop plant out of it. So you might ask yourself, is this realistic? And I tell you, yes, because people already could show, uh, colleagues in, in, in the US could already show that you can transform a wild tomato plant in a cultivated tomato plant by using the CRISPR-Cas technology and inducing a few changes at the same time. So you make out of small fruits, big fruits, you make out of a few fruits, many more fruits on a specific plant. You also change the vitamin content in a positive way in this plant. And maybe you also remove uh, the bitter taste and then you have a cultivated plant. And this is much more easy than to try to really adopt our cultivated plants we are using at the moment uh, 
to make them more heat and salt resistant. And so in principle, this technology gives us the possibility to very quickly react on global warming. I mean, we all know the time is running out. The population is, is, uh, grows, is, is cannot be stopped in the next 50 to 100 years. The temperature globally is rising very uh, extremely in the last years, as we all realized. And so I think that only by breaking the rules of genetics will we be able to really get a sustainable world and a sustainable agriculture to uh, solve this problem. Thank you so much.